Hello everyone, I am loading the screen so that I can see all of you. Jumping into the studio. <laughs> this coffee is delicious. I love coffee. Alright, let me see if I can adjust this slightly. Yeah, that looks pretty good. And you can hear me. We have to do our mic check, our weekly mic check. Loopy Lucan, what do you talk about on your channel since you just asked me to subscribe to you? Uh, Alright, perfect. Hey, Jerry, what are you doing awake at this hour? <laughs> Glad to hear the mic is working. All right, so today's topic is going to be about cleaning equipment. But before I get into that, I want to talk about a few things first with all of you. First thing, I re uh, released a little tiny video two days ago and asked you for feedback on the Anemone Cube because I wanted to see what you wanted to hear. And to be honest, uh, those comments helped me come up with a decent game plan for the next video about that tank. And uh, I'll give you just a quick uh, um, teaser. I was going to say hint. Hint doesn't make any sense. A teaser would be that I shot video when I added all the clownfish to that tank and never released it. And I kept saying I'm going to, but I didn't really have a reason to release it. So how about <laughs> an update on that tank, and I'll show you where all those clownfish came from, what their backstory is, and uh, then kind of bring you up to date on what's going on with the tank overall. I think that would actually be pretty interesting and uh, enjoyable, and people love update videos, right? The <clears throat> pictures I took um, that you saw at the end of that video, those are all macro shots, and I shot them on my Nikon, and I used a 50, you know, a 35 millimeter lens, and I actually used the flash for some of those shots, which I usually don't do, but I love to see the texture of corals. I like to see their skin. And it's got me super motivated to get back into macro photography, or to, uh, macro photography for 2018. And so I am going to be busting out the tripod, getting out my uh, extension tubes, which I did an article about years ago. And I'm going to hook it up to a few different lenses and get right into those polyps' faces. I want to see exactly what makes them tick. Uh, it's, it's one of those things I love. I've seen some guys out there with much better gear doing fantastic photography, and I'm super jealous of their ability. And the only thing that stands between me and that type of uh, result is money. <laughs> if I could buy their camera with their lenses, I could do that all day long. But no, it's a... Uh, I, mm, I really don't want to update or upgrade my camera body as well as the lenses to get that type of National Geographic uh, quality. I mean, I'd love it, but no, I, I can't justify the expense because the iPhone camera is so phenomenal. It gets me such great pictures on a regular basis. And the Nikon does a good job. I just want better. I've always wanted better. And I have to kind of rein it in and tell myself no from time to time. Uh, let me scoot this over. The chat window is getting a little cut off. I already did. Someone just asked me to give them a shout out. Since I've already replied to that person, they should know I was talking about them before. <laughs> Let's see. All right, let me scroll up here for a second. I'm going to answer a couple questions. Uh, one person said, what kind of fish can you recommend for me on a 20-gallon plants with a school of fish? So I'm not sure if we're talking about a planted tank in the freshwater community or if we're talking about a saltwater tank that's filled with macroalgae. But Garen Swims, if you can let me know what you were asking, maybe I can fill in that answer. But with a 20-gallon tank, you are going to be limited on how much livestock you can put in there because of filtration. And the more fish you add, the more quickly the water pollutes, which could be detrimental to the livestock. Now, the plants, they might grow great in high nitrate and uh, high phosphate. So there's that. Yeah, I love... CJ's Aquarium says he uses his iPhone for all his videos. I have been shooting all the YouTube videos that you have watched for the last two and a half years, maybe three years? I have to check the dates. Uh, on iPhones. And exclusively iPhones. 
there is very rarely any time where I've used anything other. I can't actually think of anything. I've used the iPhone 5, the iPhone 6, the iPhone 7, and now the iPhone 10. All of those are being done on iPhones. Yeah, okay, Freshwater, I have no advice for you. I, I'm not sure if I'm saying your right name, Jaron or Garen, but bottom line is I have zero Freshwater experience. I do notice, I talked to the Freshwater person a few days ago, and they were talking about how it was so different in the saltwater uh, hobby. They, and he said, I, I can't seem to fill up my tank with fish. And it made me think, a lot of freshwater people like to have huge fish. You know, they grow them out to where they fill the tank or they fill it with a ton of fish. And that's not really an option with a saltwater tank. And that's basically because of what I said, water pollution. So when it comes to freshwater, I'd suggest you talk to King of DIY. Uh, that guy is a freshwater lover. He's got a huge fan base. He's got 650,000 subscribers. And uh, he can answer that question, or any of his uh, subscribers probably could answer that question far better than I ever could. All right. Um, Daniel Cossie says the aquarium... The Aquarium camera app for iPhone works great. I'll have to check that one out. I don't know if I've already checked it or not, but I just use the camera built right in. Jerry asks, how often do you completely empty the sump and clean it out? Hmm, maybe every three years. That's a project that I don't really see the need to do very often. It's easier to pump out some detritus than to literally remove every square inch of water and scrape it down to its walls. But I have done it a couple of times. All right, I'm gonna throw this on the screen really quick and then I'm gonna answer your questions. If you haven't already done it, please follow me on Facebook. The uh, link is right there below and it's a great page to follow. And I know, it's funny, I saw some comments recently where people were like, oh, I hate Facebook. Well, then again, by avoiding Facebook, you miss contests where you could win things. And I did that video about a week ago, right on Christmas Eve, where a really nice light fixture was given out on Facebook. So if you are avoiding Facebook just on principle, you're, che you're cheating your chances of winning. And some of these contests, you're competing against a couple of hundred people. I mean, your odds of winning are 1 in 200 or 1 in 800 or 1 in 50. I mean, it just, I think everyone thinks, oh, contests are too, too unlikely to happen. My friend Ashley wins contests left and right. And actually, she entered all of my contests and didn't win any, and I was amazed because she always wins all the time. Okay. Um, Musfaq Hassan says, I have a 55-gallon with two anemones. One got sucked into a power head, and the tank is very cloudy. Should I change 100% of the water or 50% is a, would be okay? Um, what are the negative things that are going to happen? Well, the first negative thing that happened was the anemone got sucked into a power head. And when that happens, what can happen is the propeller can chew up the anemone and spit out little bits into the water column and especially release the nematocysts, which are the stinging cells anemones use to sting their prey. And that stuff's just blowing through the water invisibly. The fish can't even avoid it because it's little tiny... Uh, let's call them darts, and it hits their gills, hits their faces, hits their fins. And I know a guy down in uh, San Antonio, I think it was, that ended up losing all the fish in his tank because a rose bubble tip went right through a power head, and he lost all his fish. And a big tank, too. So I always recommend to have a sponge or a foam guard on any power heads that are in a tank that has an anemone. And if you could please do that so this never happens again, that would be great. Keep in mind that if the uh, the longer you don't clean that sponge, the slower the flow coming out of the pump because it can't breathe. It can't suck in the water like it did because it's a wall of mud. So you got to take that sponge off. I have one on my anemone cube, and every single day I take the sponge off, rinse it in water, and put it back on. It takes me about 15 seconds a day. Yes, it's annoying. It works great. I've never had an anemone end up inside a, uh, a power head. So do that. Now, what to do about your tank that's cloudy? Yes, do a huge water change, number one. Um, if the anemone wasn't destroyed, it can be extracted carefully and it might heal. Um, you could add prime to the water, but it's not like you have a uh, chemical toxicity going on necessarily. I mean, I, I, you said it's a 55-gallon aquarium. We're talking about one creature. So... You could do water change, run carbon, add prime to the water, those kind of things. But I think the worst of it's behind you. And you're not going to just see a constant decline as long as you took care of the situation with that creature in your pump. 
if you uh, left it in there or if you just left it to rot in the tank, yeah, it needs to be removed. But hopefully it'll heal up and be okay. I mean, I, you didn't say how far that went. Okay, let me go back here and see what I missed now that I answered that. CJ's Aquariums asks, I have a huge anemone that's split into three. Do you have any tricks on removing them from Pukani Rock? Their feet really hold tight. And that's true. Um, there's a few things that work. I've seen fish store owners take the rock and lift it out of the water and it's hanging and they kind of pry on the foot with their fingernail or with a credit card. You can point a power head right at the creature, constantly pounding on it to irritate it to where it wants to walk somewhere else. You could try the ice cube trick. I've done it, but I went through a lot of ice cubes. You know, you basically hold an ice cube against its foot and it's supposed to make it want to retract. And ice cubes just melt in salt water. I mean, they melt because of the temperature of our tank being close to 80 degrees. And I put ice cube after ice cube after ice cube after ice cube. And it was actually kind of frustrating, but eventually you'll get some success. It depends how deep in the crevices that foot is. Um, you might be able to pivot the rock around to a different location and that also could possibly get some luck. But bottom line, it, you do have to get some purchase under the foot, under the edge of the foot, and be very careful not to tear it. I'm sure you already know that. But those are some of the tricks I've used. Uh, I like using a credit card if I can get my fingernail under there and try and get under there. But I don't use any dental tools or anything that are sharp that could poke it or tear the, the anemone. All right. Garen, Happy New Year to you as well. There's a Facebook hater right there. I found one. 3D Nublet. You don't like Facebook. Actually, I love my Facebook. I have a lot of good people I follow, and I think that's what makes it good. Now, 10 years ago, everyone hated Facebook because all they did was show you, this guy made a friend with this guy, and this one made a friend with this one, and this guy liked this page, and it was super boring. Now it's all about news. I, I, I don't really know how to not like Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I learn what's going on in the world a little bit from the news. I see lots of fun videos. I uh, see lots of newsy things that have to do with a hobby. I'm involved in a few saltwater groups on there. I, I admin one of them. And, of course, I run my own pages on there. And uh, I, I like to share fun things I discover, and I do it on Facebook daily. Matter of fact, my son posted on Facebook uh, yesterday, and he said whenever he needs to know how I'm doing, he just Googles my name to see what's going on. True, he did say that. And he probably does. Okay. Um, Zach Klabund asked, can we get a weekly update on your 400 gallon? Along with that, do your pink skunk clownfish stick to the anemone all day or do they move throughout the general area? Okay. <clears throat> a weekly update? Uh, I do updates all the time on this page and I share pictures from the tank on there and I've also been adding pictures to this one here which is on Instagram those are really the daily places um, I will drop things into the saltwater and reef keepers group um, worldwide reefing is another group on Facebook I sometimes share I of course blog things on Milo's Reef just go to milosreef.com and click the giant blog button and you'll see whatever I've blogged. I don't blog every single day, but I blog it probably three times a week. And I'm always finding something to share that I think would be good and helpful and useful. And uh, I just don't see a way of... Here's the thing. If I say, here's the reef. And then a week from now, I go, here's the reef. It, it's kind of the same thing. It actually seems kind of redundant, possibly even boring to me. And if it's boring to me, I'm afraid it's going to be even more boring to you. I see it every single day. So I try to share things that are happening, things that have changed, things that are I'm overcoming or uh, things I'm contending with. I, I feel like that's usually the best way to handle uh, disseminating information. Uh, I, like I said, I've been sharing some really pretty pictures from my reef lately. Uh, I've been motivated. The tank's doing really well. Uh, it was kind of hard for me to accept the big change from September when we tore out all the huge colonies. 
but it's growing on me. I mean, every day, I, it's actually, I, I love it. I mean, if I didn't love it, I wouldn't be in this hobby. Someone asked me, uh, what do I do for a living? I don't know where that went, so I can't say who it was. But um, what I do for a living is I sell things online for my website. And it's all aquarium filtration. You know, I can literally put someone in everything they need from the sump all the way up to the tank, uh, including the lights, uh, the, uh, uh, the additives, uh, the top-off containers, the uh, dosing containers, skimmers, pumps, heaters, um, calibration solution. I carry a lot of things. I don't stock salt. I don't stock sand. These are all super heavy items. <clears throat> um, but, I mean, you can just explore milosreef.com. And just go into the shop area and you'll see there's about 300 items in there that I sell, whether I, uh, I, sell, I resell them, you know, like a store, or I build them myself. There's both of those. And of course, I, it's pretty 50-50 on that. I fabricate a lot of things out of acrylic. And since you asked, uh, I'm going to spin into this. I had it on my list of things to talk about. So yesterday was a very nervous day for me because I've been running the CNC machine all year. But yesterday was the first day where I cut plywood on it. And I was told, yes, you can just take the, a different router bit and you can cut out these panels to make a, an aquarium stand. But I'd never done it before and I didn't want to make any mistakes because plywood's not cheap. And once you stick it on the table and you have a wrong cut, you have to go buy another whole sheet, which of course you have to go get it and bring it back and then start all over again. So I double checked my measurements over and over. Here was my rough sketch. <clears throat> that I worked on and you can see I changed my numbers here and then I changed them again and I oh, sorry and I changed them again and I was this isn't right and I came up here and then I found another mistake over here I can it's really hard to do this on a camera backwards but I had to verify everything was right and then I had to double check it again to make sure I had my thicknesses correct and uh, accounted for the trim because this stand has to hold a tank that's 36 by 36 and it has to fit through a door that's 36 wide so the stand is actually 36 by 36 by 35. If you follow me on Instagram, last night I shared probably 10 or 12 pictures of me building that stand kind of in live, uh, you know, every few minutes you got another picture updating where I was next on the stand. And I'm really pleased how Minion cut out all the pieces. And I'm super pleased I didn't make any mistakes because it's coming out really nicely. I'm going to finish it up today. I deliver it tomorrow to the proud owner who's been waiting a long time. And... Uh, I don't normally make stands, but um, I can. Uh, I've done it in the past, and uh, I, I usually just focus on the acrylic work and, of course, selling RO systems and filters and membranes and uh, T-shirts and, you know, normal things that everyone uses all the time. Stands take a little more time. And this customer has waited a very long time. He's been overly patient, and I'm just glad it's done, and he's going to get to enjoy it now. Evan Kegel says, my tank sucks. All right. Thanks, Evan. Uh, Cody asked, are you, did you marry your fiance? I never got engaged. I was dating someone great and she didn't feel the same way. And that was the end of that. Let's see. Daniel Cossey asks, be, uh, he asks, I just installed an auto shutoff valve on my system and noticed that when it shuts off, the pressure builds to a little over 100 PSI. Is this normal? Actually, it's not. Uh, what should happen when you install an auto shutoff valve is it is designed to turn off the system once it is pressurized. So normally when you turn on the system, the pressure goes up to whatever the pressure is supposed to be, let's say 60. And then when you close the valve after the system and leave the water pressure on, on the cold water line going in, the valve will close the water going through the system and you'll watch the pressure gauge go to zero. And now it's off and no wastewater comes out of the waistline. And of course, no water can come out of the good tubing because those valves are closed. But for the pressure to go up tells me that the valve was installed incorrectly. Now, if you go to mealsreef.com and go to ab about... It might be about me live. There's a FAQ section, and I literally have pictures. Well, actually, right here on YouTube, too. I have a video how to install the auto shutoff valve correctly, and it has to go in the exact right way. 
it can't be backwards and it can't be upside down. There's four tubes and all four tubes have to be in the right order. So you can either check the FAQ on my website where I have pictures and description, or you can find the video on my YouTube channel in the RO section, and you can see how that's supposed to be installed. And you know, worst case, get a hold of me and I'll help you uh, work your way through it. Um, Chad Oliver says, I just had a tank disaster. Everything is dead. All I've left is the clown and a six-line RAS. I have the clown in a hospital tank, but the six-line is being too stubborn to get him out. Uh, if you, do you need to take him out of the, the tank that crashed? And what happened? You didn't really explain what the, the disaster was, what killed everything. Um, if you have to remove a fish and you can't get it out, the best, simplest, quickest solution is to drain as much water as you can from the tank straight into a trash can or two. And that way you have about this much water and then you can scoop out any fish that are flopping around in a very shallow puddle of water. And that way you could get that wrasse out. He might be stuck in a rock. You know, they might, you know, dart into a hole and you may have to take that rock and like, uh, shake it out over your hospital tank and drop that fish in there. And good luck on rebuilding your tank. I'm so sorry to hear that happened. How many tanks would you put in a 180 gallon tank? Jose Pastor asks. Uh, three? <laughs> A 180-gallon tank is 6 feet by 2 feet by 2 feet. And depending on the species of tang, they can swim for miles a day. So, you know, we have to take into consideration their lack of swimming room, especially once you add rock work to the tank and you fill it up with rock, you end up with uh, less space and uh, they can't swim as much. So they're doing more of this back and forth thing rather than doing laps, which they might prefer. And even then, it's still a very fixed footprint. I would definitely recommend juvenile tangs, little small guys, if you can get your hands on. I, I love little fish. I love watching them grow. Um, I, some of you noticed the hippo tang in my anemone cube from the last video. He's been in there for about a year and a half. I need to look at the date. I haven't looked that up yet. And when I got him, he was about this big. Super cute. Yes, I named him Dory because that's his name. And <laughs> he's been awesome. But, you know, at some point he's got to move out of there because that's a two foot by two foot by two foot tank. And, you know, he probably do well in a bigger tank. Uh, the hippo tang is known to gnaw on zoanthids, so I'm not really ecstatic about putting them in the 400 gallon, but putting them in the frag system isn't gonna be a lot better, even though it's a four foot long tank, it gives them some linear length to run. Uh, he's uh, probably doubled in size since I got him. I do know that over time, uh, that tangs over time will kind of grow to fit their tank, typically, unless you're just a crazy overfeeder, uh, you don't just like put in a tiny tang and boom, it's, you know, 18 inches inside your, your tank. Uh, it takes time to build. And look at the species you've picked. See how long it'll live and see to what size it'll grow before you uh, purchase it. That way you're familiar with the type of tang it is, what it gets along with. That's kind of all, you know, you have to work with. Like, you, your question was really open-ended. Do you mean three of the exact same species, like three yellow tangs, for example? Or do you mean... You want an aggressive tang and a timid tang and a tang that cleans the glass and the walls and the rock, you know. So you have to kind of keep that in mind. Um, I'm looking through more of these comments and I'm going to jump into my topic. Dalton Hacken asks, out of curiosity, how often do you do maintenance on your piping and other plumbing on your system? Um, annually, I'd say. I actually was on top of both my tanks in the last week, making sure that the drain holes in my uh, Durso standpipes were unobstructed. I felt like the salt had been building up within them to some degree and affecting how the water flowed out. And so I got up there and I inspected them and I poked, a, actually I used a drill bit on the, the big reef. <laughs> I just went grind, 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 and all five of those drains. And then in the, or four of those drains, there's only four in that tank. And then on the anemone cube, I have a very small hole and I used a toothpick and just made sure that it was unobstructed. And that was about it. Uh, I don't often remove plumbing to go through it entirely, but if I rebuild something, that's a great time to inspect. I have very rarely found anything in my pipes. And I've had other people post pictures that I was friends with. And theirs would just be like stalactites and stalagmites, just filling up the pipe, just obstructing like crazy. And that's possibly because of the things they choose to do, like maybe they use caulk washer, which I don't use. Uh, I you know, run a calcium reactor, 
and that takes care of alkalinity and calcium and the levels always stay within tolerance you know other than when my alkalinity spikes up crazy high but it doesn't create something weird inside the pipes now what have i found in pipes over the years uh like i took out this one pipe that had been running for 18 months and i cut the pipe up because it was a big long run and i found a cucumber in there and he was really small because he hardly had found any food but he never tried to crawl out of that pipe so i scooped him out and i put him in my refugium so he could live all right Okay, this is a great question. Where did it go? Just saw it. Thomas asked, why isn't ozone discussed and used more? I don't discuss it because I've never used it. And I try to talk about the things I know things about. So I've never seen the need to run ozone. And a uh, quick little oddity in my life, you know, when the AC guy was out here to work on, you know, the system you know, for the house, he said, hey, you know, we should install an ozone or ozonizer i guess he said inside your ac system and you know he also wanted to add uv i mean he wanted to do both the two things we put on aquariums right and i told him absolutely not i don't want that and he just looked at me and he you know he asked why and i said well have you ever heard of ozone alert days when they say don't go out into the outside you know and be cautious today and you know avoid the sun i mean they they, they tell you it's a health risk well the last thing i want is something like that in my uh air conditioner and heating system that moves all the air I breathe around the clock. <laughs> I'm just like, if it's dangerous out there, well, don't let me bring it and wire it in here. What if it goes wrong and starts affecting me negatively? So, yeah, I, I didn't pay for the extra upgrade he was offering, and uh, you know, I've never put that on my tank. I know ozone can help make your water look more clear. It's adding a third oxygen molecule, if I'm correct. Uh, but I've got zero experience with it, so I don't talk about it much. I've never felt the need. To be honest, if you run a Starfire tank, which is the type of glass I use, your water's crystal clear. I mean, it's looking through perfect glass. Uh, maybe people that have a standard tank, you know, with the greener glass, the green hue, like to run ozone to kind of get more clarity. But I've never looked at my tank and said, oh, just wish my clarity was better. I, it's, that's why I've always had Starfire tanks since 2004. Um, Dave's Nano Tanks asks, can you suggest a quiet return pump for an all-in-one to replace a MaxiJet 1200? The MaxiJet should be pretty quiet. Is it old? Maybe you just need to replace it with a fresh one. Or maybe you just need to clean it. All right. I know there's more questions. I'm going to get into my topic because I want to talk about that. In the meantime, while I'm talking, feel free to type in the chat boxes, what you got for Christmas, and what your reef goals are for 2018. Have you started thinking about what you want to do next year with your tank? Uh, if you can tell me those things, I'd love to hear what you're going to do. I, uh, for myself, for Christmas, I got mostly Christmas ornaments for my friends and family. Uh, they gave me fish-related things to hang on my tree, which was awesome. And I got some Star Wars-related things to hang on my tree, which is equally awesome. And uh, so now I have more ornaments. I'm actually glad the tree is still up because I just got another package in the mail two days ago. And I got to hang those up to enjoy now for a few more days. This tree is near the end of its life, despite the auto top off that I installed on it. It's just, you know, I bought it before Thanksgiving. And because it was on sale, so I bought it. And, uh, I, you know, I mean, it's almost the first. It lasted pretty good. Uh, I did get this shirt, which I will wear on Facebook. This came from my best friend. And i um, huge uh, Little Mermaid fan, so... I almost wore it today, but then I thought, I better explain why I'm wearing the Little Mermaid. <laughs> Maybe I don't have to explain myself. I love the Little Mermaid. Judge me. I don't care. All right. Cleaning equipment. I want to get into this topic because I think it's a good one. I do have a video on my channel <clears throat> that's about tools, and it shows all the different things I use. So feel free to find that video, and it might be in one of my playlists. It might be easier to find. Or just type in tools and a little search thing on my my. YouTube page, and it'll take you right to it. But it, there's a few things that I recommend for cleaning. Number one, I like white vinegar. You can buy white vinegar by the gallon at Walmart or uh, at uh, you know the supermarket. Um, it's like two dollars for a gallon, and white vinegar works great. It's just slow. So I would, you can choose what concentration you want to use. I've used 100% vinegar. I've used 50/50. You know. 
tap water, 50%, and then equal part of uh, white vinegar. I've used a little less. And then I take the item and I submerge it in there and let it sit, typically overnight. I have a small bucket just for this process. I have larger buckets, of course, because we all do. And I would put my gear in there and soak it in, in the vinegar water solution. And then the next day, I can take it out to the sink and I can scrub all the parts and get them nice and clean. If you are impatient, like I am, and you don't want to use vinegar and you like to live life more riskily, <laughs> is that a word? More risky than others? You can use muriatic acid. And I love muriatic acid. Uh, it's also called hydrochloric acid. And it's available at Home Depot, Lowe's. You will find the pool section at the supermarket or at Walmart. And it's sold by the gallon. And of course, they're going to check your ID when you're trying to leave the building. It's just one of the things they do when you're uh, purchasing that stuff at the store. I guess parents only. And uh, that stuff, it's 10 times stronger than white vinegar. So it works a lot quicker. And you can take the the uh, bucket of water you're going to put your item in, you know, fill that bucket up with some water. Let's just use some real numbers. Uh, let's say I'm trying to clean <clears throat> a few power heads, I don't know, and I've got a five gallon bucket, I put in three gallons of tap water, and then I would use maybe one or two cups of muriatic acid. I pour the acid in carefully so it doesn't spatter and splash. You can wear gloves, you can wear eye protection. Those are both very wise things to do. Matter of fact, even the clothing you're wearing, you should decide, is it something you ever want to wear again? And I say that because if it gets spattered on there, it could, it's just sort of like working with bleach and this is your favorite shirt and somehow you got bleach dots and you're like, no. So don't ruin your favorite shirt because you're working with acid. You know, If there's a chance it might get damaged, wear something ratty, wear that shirt you like to wear when you're painting the house or something. Um, same with jeans, you know, if, wear the jeans you don't care about, not the ones you go out on dates with. Uh, and then consider your environment. It's usually best to work with muriatic acid outside because lots of fresh air. If you um, need to dump it out somewhere, choose the spot wisely. If you just dump it out on the concrete, the muriatic acid will etch the concrete and you might have a big white spot on the concrete that wasn't there before because it etched it. So uh, I like to dispose of it in a spot that makes sense to me, like an area where nothing's alive, or if I'm being especially vindictive, I like to pour it on poison ivy. Ha ha. <laughs> because you want to burn it away. Um, but you can pour it down a drain, of course, uh, cautiously. And uh, you can definitely water down the area. Like where you're dumping this out, you can have a garden hose and just flush that area with a lot of water as you're pouring it out to dilute, dilute, dilute. And that, you know, takes away any risk. Also, and I'm, I'm, I don't know the answer to this, but there's probably some trick like adding baking soda to cancel it out, like to neutralize it so it's not an acid anymore. Just Google that because I don't know the answer to that, but that's another choice you could do, and that is definitely easy to dispose of. You know, neutralize the acid with a base, and then it's evened out, and you can just pour it out, and that's the end of it. But muriatic acid is awesome because you can take your submerged item, like let's say you have a power head, um, that is really encrusted with coralline and bubble algae and hair algae and all the algaes. And you just submerge it in there and you will see it bubbling like uh, Alka-Seltzer or like peroxide on a wound. You just see the bubbles rising. In about 20 minutes, the bubbles stop and that means it's done. You can now remove it carefully and you can scrub it or you can scrub off the upper strata or layer of crap and then put it back in and have it bubble some more. But it's much quicker. Now, most companies will tell you don't put their pumps in muriatic acid. Um, and usually it's because of the rubber seals. Myself, I've done it many times. I've never had a problem occur with anything. I use Tunzi pumps. I've used Vortec pumps. I would just put them in there. Now, one of the tricks I like to do with cleaning pumps when I'm using an acid solution or a vinegar solution is I like to plug them in so they're running in the solution, which keeps everything mixing all the time, and it's flowing through all of the pumps so that I can clean all the innards. So I take, you know, in the case of You've got a bucket of acid, you know, which is going to sting you, especially if you have any cuts on your hands. That's why I said rubber gloves. But if you're being daring and you're just like, eh, then don't have cuts on your hands, okay? And you can reach in. Or if it's a power head that's running inside the solution, you can unplug it from the wall, and you can lift it by the cord out of the, the puddle of solution, lift it out, and drop it in a rinse bucket and plug it in again to let it rinse briefly, and then you can start cleaning it. So you can kind of have a little workstation set up. But that works out really well, and uh, I've done it with uh, skimmer pumps. 
I've done it with uh, circulation pumps. External pumps, you can't do that, but you can take parts out of the uh, external pump, you know, like your impeller and uh, the, the housing shroud, and you can put those in a vinegar solution or if you want it in the acid solution for quicker results. But uh, just, you know, never pour the acid in the bucket first and then add water. You always add acid to the water solution. That's very important. That's the number one rule. Other than that, you um, <clears throat> those two things work great. Just using regular tap water, it's not really going to help you much. It'll help knock off some big stuff, but it's going to still look dirty. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that if you stay on top of cleaning things and you don't put it off forever, it's a lot easier to clean. If you clean a Vortec power head, for example, once a year, it's going to take a lot longer to get it clean than if you pull it out monthly and clean it. Uh, I tend to believe that the German hobbyists are much better at this than we are. They keep all their equipment immaculate all the time. It seems like every month they clean all their equipment. And so, for example, I used to see tanks from German hobbyists that have tonsy pumps, and their tonsy pumps always look like they just bought the pump that day. And it's because they take it out, they clean it, because they don't want it to become an eyesore. They don't try to make it blend in with coralline algae and all the uh, other algaes that tend to accumulate on plastic. Instead, they keep it nice and pristine. And I kind of want to do that, but I'm not motivated that way. <clears throat> Another thing that will make cleaning easier for you is if you have an extra of that pump that you're going to clean. And that's what I do with all my pumps. All my Vortec pumps have an extra wet side. So I have an extra MP60, I have an, uh, an extra uh, MP40, and I have an extra MP10. And they're always ready to go. And that way I can just swap one out and put one into vinegar and let it sit for a day or <laughs> a week. <laughs> <coughs> And I just do that. I, I let it sit there, and then eventually I pick it up and I scrub it in the sink with a small toothbrush. Um, I have pipe brushes that go through tubing, and uh, I have scrapers. I use credit cards. I use dental tools. Uh, you know, I, I found those at Harbor Freight for nothing. Uh, these are and then sponges. Let me talk about sponges. <clears throat> Sorry, I got something in my throat. Uh, sponges. When you buy them at the supermarket. And you flip them over, you know, you know, it might be like the yellow one with a green scrubby pad on one side. And almost every single sponge I ever pick up in the store says, not safe for aquarium use. And part of that is probably because they put an anti-mold stuff inside the sponge. Um, the, there are sponges that actually have soaps laced into them. I mean, obviously they don't last forever, but they're sold that way for ease of use for a person washing dishes. But... I've used the blue sponges and the yellow sponges with the scrubby pads on them many, many times. I've never had a, a, anything happen. Now, is it because I'm not cleaning an 8-gallon tank? I'm cleaning a 400-gallon tank? You know, could it be my water volume is so large? I look at the sponges carefully, you know, try to make sure there's no additives. And I will take them and <clears throat> open the package, of course, smell them. And, you know, if, it's, if I don't detect, like, an aroma of some kind of cleaner or some kind of fragrance... I'm not too worried about it. I'll rinse it in the water quite a bit in the sink, you know, three or four squeezes or so. You can put it in your microwave, damp, you know, not wet, but just squeeze out so it's damp. Put it in the microwave and run it for a minute. That'll kill anything in the sponge. And then you can go ahead and you can clean your tank with it, and that will be your official tank sponge. So, for example, if you use yellow sponges in your sink all the time, buy a blue one for the aquarium. That way, when you see a blue one, you know that's not for dishes, and everyone else in your family knows not to touch it but that is your cleaning sponge. And then keep that sponge with your cleaning gear. Don't leave it on the, the kitchen counter or in the sink where it's possibly mixed up or gets polluted with something. Always, you know, when you're cleaning, move all the other things out of the way. You don't want to have your soapy sponge nearby and you don't want someone rinsing off something on your cleaning gear because they were trying to dump out a cup of coffee or whatever in the sink that you're sharing. So, you know, be aware of that. Try to schedule your time where you can focus on that area and not have anyone ruin it. And then no matter what, when you're done cleaning everything, rinse, 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 and let it dry. The uh, rinsing is really important because, like I said, if you walked away from it for a while, you don't know what happened to it before it got back into your tank. So rinse it off one more time. You can let it air dry. You can go reinstall it right now because you know it's nice and fresh and there's no chance of soap on it. Okay? That's pretty much it for cleaning. If you have any questions about cleaning, feel free to ask. Let me get back to your comments now. <clears throat> <laughs> Cody asks, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin? 
I wish I'd bought some. <laughs> <coughs> uh, there's a, a video that appears, I'm going to put it a link in the description after this thing uploads to YouTube. Uh, there's a video that appears on Facebook every single day called Nos Daily. And I think the guy's first name is Nos, or it's short for something. And he's an Israeli guy, and he does these really upbeat motivational videos every single day for one minute, and I'm, I'm addicted. I've, I caught him about two weeks ago, ten days ago. Apparently he's been doing it for a year and has a huge fan base. Well, one of the most recent videos he did was about corals. So, of course, that caught my eye. And he said it's like having Bitcoin in your house. So I will put a link to that, or you can go Google it. Just look up Nas Daily, Bitcoin, Facebook, and it'll take you to that video. And it, was, it was pretty funny. And it's 60 seconds. Um, let's see. There's a lot of stuff here. You guys have been talking like crazy. Uh, J.W. Brashier says, This fall I gradually lost all my SPS and clams. I got all new salad for test kits, but I haven't found anything out of spec. Any experience with the ICP analysis or any other advice? I would definitely, you know, you have brand new kits, and assuming you're using the kits correctly, I would then say take your water sample that you just tested, you know, like that cup of water, and go to the fish store and have them test it with all their kits and verify your results to make sure they match. If um, both of those match and every parameter is right, but you're losing livestock, there's either a pollutant that's hitting the tank that you can't test for, like an aerosol or, for example, <laughs> Some people have a reef tank near, or it, maybe they have a reef tank in their bedroom near the master bathroom where their, their spouse does a lot of hairspray and a lot of perfumes, a lot of oils, a lot of lotions. That stuff actually can get into the water and can kill livestock. It could be that you lost a lot of livestock because of power outages when you're not there or when you're asleep. It could be that there is a pump impeller uh, that has cracked open and is releasing crap into the water. It could be a heater that has failed and is exposed to salt water, and it's releasing stuff into the water that's killing your livestock. So there's a lot of things. It could be a lot of different things. You're going to have to really go from the ground up and inspect everything, analyze the environment, and, of course, double-check your water. Now, ICP is a great way to get your water tested. I have still not done it. I want to do it, and I'm going to do it. That will be one of my goals for 2018, to submit my water to ICP and see what kind of numbers they get. Mike Flores says he has some pallies that are taking over his rock work, and how can you know he control that? That's going to be a matter of scraping them off the rock carefully, making sure you don't get any of that stuff in your face, in your mouth, in your eyes, in any open wounds. Do not inhale it, the fumes, or get any of the, the uh, liquid that emanates from their little polypeds squirted on you. Be very careful, but scrape them off the rock. You can scrape them off the rock underwater and then you know, pick them out with tweezers and throw them away. You can do this work in the sink. If you're working in the sink and you've got the rock there in the sink and you're just scraping away, close your mouth. A lot of people don't notice when they're working intently, they become mouth breathers and they hang their mouth open. And then if that little polyp gets upset and squeezes and squirts water, you might get some pelitoxin in your mouth. So be cautious. Uh, be smart. You could wear... A mask. You could wear eye protection again. You could wear rubber gloves. You can go all in like a you know, like a surgeon. Uh, I have never had that need. I, I guess I just stay aware of my environment, and I'm wearing glasses, and I keep my mouth shut. <laughs> For a guy that talks all the time, I keep my mouth shut when I'm working around pallies. Fishy Reefer says, "Good morning. I have softy corals. They are looking very brown. I have T5s." and some uh, low-power LEDs, good water parameters, dosing aqua vitro. Brown corals. Um, very likely your nutrients are too high in the water. Check your nitrate, check your phosphate, um, and check how long you run your lights per day. Uh, usually the zoex... zoex oh man, I'm not going to say this word right. Zoxanthellae, that's inside the coral, will turn more and more brown based on the nutrient level in your tank. And by reducing that nutrient load, 
uh, you'll see them get their nicer colors back. You can uh, also add some carbon in a reactor, uh, half a cup of carbon per uh, 50 gallons of water, and that can help pull some stuff out of the water as well. Of course, water changes are going to help make the water a little cleaner for those corals. But if you're trying to have the lovely pastels and uh, vivid colors, you can. A lot of soft corals are kind of in the brown family, but they could be more tan and not so dark. So I would check into that. Josh Armida, Armina said, what do you think of nanobubbles? I think they're crazy. Um, I only know of one person that did it, and uh, they were trying to remove what really appeared to be dinoflagellates in their tank, and they used nanobubbles every single night, trying to create a lot of fizz in the tank that would lift the stuff off the bottom so it could be skimmed out. And uh, it's a big messy thing, and uh, I just can't believe it caught on. There's certain things in the hobby that shock me, and uh, that one doesn't shock me. That was just kind of like, really? But the one that shocked me recently, there's a thread on Reef to Reef right now that talks about dinoflagellates, which a lot of people deal with. And the latest cure that someone has come up with is to put bleach in your tank. And I am just... My mind is blown. I cannot believe anyone would recommend that. I can't believe anyone tried it. And I'm just going to be stubborn and avoid it. I am not going to recommend that to anyone. I think that's... It's a horrible decision and that's me just speaking out of turn not doing research on this i just cannot believe someone put bleach inside a living biotope with fish and corals i don't care if it's a tenth of a milliliter i just wow okay no <clears throat> sorry uh anthony mckay says he's using the triton system and it says don't use ozone or uv because it kills the good and the bad uh uv is a light bulb, obviously, the water passes over. And whatever passes over it, good bacteria or bad bacteria, it's definitely going to kill it. So, yeah, that would definitely not be ideal if you're trying to have a nice, healthy refugium um, and you're trying to have a lot of bacteria in the system. Like I said, I don't use UV or ozone. Dave's Nano Tank says there's something called Rico's Nano Challenge 2018. I'll have to look that one up and see what it is. Elite Sky Banana says, I have these weird particles in the water and I don't know how to fix it or what it is. Uh, maybe you could just trap them with a filter sock. Or uh, if it's a smaller tank, you could set up a canister filter next to the tank to run overnight to kind of catch the stuff blowing around. And hopefully you can find the source. My own tank for the last couple of months has had that exact problem. I'm getting these flakes blowing around. I'm just basically ignoring it. But I really think what I need to do is remove the return pump and clean it really well and reinstall it. I just have this feeling it's all happening in that spot but I haven't verified it yet. Uh, how do I say this? Chris Tian Kovacs says he has a quick question. What would be your advice for a new reefer to balance the system? My nitrates are 5 to 10. My phosphates are around 1. To balance the system. Um, you're wanting to match natural seawater parameters and your nitrates are a little bit high, and your phosphates are definitely high. You want to get them a little bit lower. Um, 0.1 would be great versus 1 ppm. So get that down lower. You might need to change some water more frequently. Uh, there are other things you can add, but water changes, even though I'm not a huge fan of doing them, because, I mean, they're, they're work, right? Uh, water changes are usually the cheapest solution for most problems in our tanks. As long as your pH, your salinity, and your temperature match, you can change all the water you want as frequently as you want, and it will not hurt your tank. Temperature, pH, and salinity have to match. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. Oh, nice. So uh, John Albin got himself a new skimmer and a Milwaukee digital refractometer. You have a great wife, sir. And congratulations on setting up your first tank this year. Fishy Reefer said that they made a, sh a, sh <clears throat> a sump vac using a power head and a PVC pipe, and it works great. But you have to prime the pump to get it started. But now the sump is staying nice and clean. I actually talked about a pump a while back uh, that is made by uh, Cobalt. It's called the EXT800. It's designed for their canister filter, but I actually bought, you know, one of those, and now I stock them in my shop for people because you put a tube on both ends and the water flows through the pump, and it's a great way to suck detritus out of your sump, and I've sold a lot of them. 
So I have a bunch in stock right now. <clears throat> Mark Thompson says he's stealing garage space for a new fish room, exactly like my original. Uh, <laughs> and then he said, maybe I should skip the seven foot by seven foot and just catch up with you. Mine, I believe, is eight by 12. My first one was five by six, but part of my tank stuck out into the room. Uh, and so I just needed a small area to get behind it. But when I set up the 400 gallon, I said, I'm making a bigger room. I'm pouring concrete to make the floor the same height as the rest of the house. So when you walk in, you don't step down in. Because when people would come over, they would step in and fall into the fish room because they were always like, wow, and then they'd, they'd trip. And I'd always say, there's a step, and they'd still fall in. You know, I'm like, Ugh. So I wanted to avoid that because people like to come over and see the reef, and I wanted to make sure there was no risk. So I poured the concrete, and that worked out great. Uh, okay, here's a great question. Uh, Sistreak asks, could you use citric acid, like the orange-based cleaners, to clean your equipment? I would think so, yeah, and usually those have a little scrubby thing in them too, but just rinse it really, really well. And just make sure you get that removed. Ribbity Reptiles. Can you believe that name? That this guy's a saltwater guy? You'd think he'd be snakes and lizards and stuff, right? He got a full Magna Conference pass. Congratulations, buddy. I'll see you there. Ah, thank you. Uh, Reefkeeper says, yes, baking soda works to neutralize the acid. I just didn't want to say the wrong thing, and then everyone's like, oh, you gave bad advice. So thank you for saying that. So obviously adding that in and then stirring it would then break it down and neutralize. And the reason I said to do the acid outside is so you don't breathe in the fumes because muriatic acid has a horrible smell and it can make it hard for your lungs to breathe. <gasps> I just saw someone say hello from Münster, Germany. I've been there. I lived in Switzerland when I was young. Oh, there you go. Nancy Campbell talks about the Magic Eraser. That's another good tip for cleaning the tank itself. I was talking about more about cleaning the gear. But I haven't tried to use Magic Erasers like to clean a Vortec Powerhead or a Maxi Jet or something. I guess I just thought that was really ideal for cleaning the glass. Uh, I'll have to try that out. Thanks, Nancy. Sin City Reefing says, how long would you uh, recommend to wait to add an anemone? And his tank is three months old. I would say wait another six months, maybe nine. And that's only because I want you to be intimately familiar with your own tank. It's, you know, we talk about, oh, the tank needs to be more mature. The reef keeper has to be more mature as well. Now, if you have 15 years experience and you're wanting to put an enemy in a three-month-old tank, you probably could do it and be successful because you know what to look for. But if you're a new hobbyist, which I believe you are based on your comment, you want to make sure that you understand the inter... In I forget, I'm not going to say the word, I'm going to say it wrong. Uh, you want to know your tank so well that you can measure, you can tell at a glance the temperature is okay, the salinity is okay. You know, these are things that we just, you, you become in tune with your system and you know when things are right, you know when things are wrong, and you can jump in before it becomes a train wreck. So I would say give yourself more time in the hobby, uh, test your water every week, Log your, your results so you can kind of track your history. If you're using an iPhone, grab Reef Trace. That's the app I use right now. As a matter of fact, Reef Trace is still on sale, everyone. They didn't change the price back. It's still $2.99. So if you didn't buy it yet, grab it because I know the price is going to go back up. It's gonna, someone's going to notice. They're going to hear this video and say, oh, and they're going to fix it. So go grab that app. I love that app because it lets me track my data and it's letting me uh, find fish stores and it's showing me reef news and it's doing a lot of neat things. So I'm a partner in that app. So yes, I have a little bit of a stake in everyone buying that app, but I, I'm not saying buy it because I need your money. I'm saying buy it because it's helpful. And it's a great way to share your results because it'll screenshot and send it to Facebook or Instagram or email or text. It's a real easy way to share. So grab Reef Trace live. Um, see, one person just said they had an enemy after three weeks. But that person also has been talking about how they are, have access to the ocean and then get ocean water and get the livestock they want. So that's not exactly the same as somebody that's landlocked and learning the hobby and having to rely on a fish store that might be 30 to 45 minutes away. Uh, Brad... Cyphus asks, is there any reef tools out there to cut one inch diameter SPS? I really like my bandsaw. Uh, that works great, 
but that would require you to actually pull the coral out of the water and then push it through the bandsaw blade. And that'll definitely cut through one inch, no problem. The, the diamond coated blade works great. If you can't do it out of the tank and you wanna do work in the tank, maybe you could lower the water level and you could take a Dremel with a very large uh, cutting wheel. And you're gonna need that cutting wheel to be about an inch and a half, a diamond tip, inch and a half, because you're only gonna get three quarters of an inch of blade because you know the, the bolt goes through the center and there's three quarters of an inch on the other side. So you can only get so far through the coral and then you have to work from the other side and, and you kind of, sort of like cutting a tree, you're hitting it from different sides to get that piece out. Are you still trying to remove that big section that's inside your reef? Because it needs to go. And I look forward to seeing the change. Um, okay, Reef Keeper says they've been fighting dino flagellates for the last five months. And what is my recommendation? And have I tried Dino X yet? I have not. But I was happy to see it existed. Um, there's something new on the market. Fluconazole. And uh, Reef HD sent me some bottles to put in my shop. And I believe that stuff was also supposed to help with Dino flagellates. So let me get it added to my shop today. And you can buy yourself a bottle. And you can try that out in your tank. Um, it's, it's a new product, you know, I mean, okay, it, fluconazole has always existed. Apparently it was made for humans to get rid of yeast, I think, fungus, something like that. And, uh, someone tried out in a tank and, uh, they found some success with it. And so Reef HD bottled it up where you can buy the bottles and it's, you know, I don't know. There's a fixed amount of tablets inside there and you do one a day and it's supposed to help re uh, remove it. And I told him, I said, well, I don't have any dinos. I really want to try the product before I sell it. And he said, he hurt, you know, he, the guy's joking with me. And so I don't know how true this is. All right. I'm just going to say what I was told. He said, rumor has it, if you use triple the dose, it'll make the bubble algae go away from your tank. And I was like, well, I do have bubble algae. So I do want to try that out and see what happens, but I haven't tried it yet. Um, but that's one way. Um, with dino flagellates, the basic rules are high, keeping a high pH, which is 8.5, and maintaining 8.5 for a while. Um, uh, killing all the lights, and that's hard on corals, especially when you're leaving them off for like four to five days. And no water changes whatsoever, because apparently the new water is constantly adding fuel to the dino flagellates for them to grow. Because they do like light, they do like whatever comes in new salt water. So don't do that. And uh, for me, whenever I have any kind of problem in my tank, whether it's uh, you know, cyano or dinoflagellates or whatever weird thing has occurred, I try to remove physically as much of it as I can in the first place. Like I had a gorgonian that I brought home from Florida and it just got covered in this uh, stuff. It was dinos. And I just lifted out of the tank very carefully and I put it in a bucket of salt water and I swirled it around and around and around and around. And you just see all the browns are just flying off the coral and it just looked like a tornado in there. And I lifted the coral out clean and put it back in my reef. Three days later, it was covered in dino. I had to do it again. And I did this for several, you know, like three times. And I thought, I can't just keep shaking this coral in a bucket of water for the rest of its life. This is ridiculous. This has to end. And uh, so I ended up putting uh, peroxide in my tank. I was putting in one milliliter of peroxide per 10 gallons of water every day for eight days in a row. Leave everything running, leave lights on and all that. And it would just get rid of what was left in my tank. And that worked for me, but I don't have a lot. I didn't have a lot. I removed the majority of it from my system by targeting what I found and get it out as quickly as possible. So that is kind of uh, my stance on that one. I've never had a full on outbreak. Matter of fact, I'm still looking for the pictures uh, many years ago, I visited someone during my travels, and he had <clears throat> a massively infested tank <coughs> with dinoflagellates. And I took a picture because I was like, I need this for my you know, ID page and for you know, an article. I can't find the picture. And I thought I found it recently, and I was so disappointed when I didn't because I was sure I finally found that magic folder. I'm still looking. But it, was, it looks like snot. His was bright green. A lot of times it's browner. Daniel, you moved your auto shutoff valve before the pre-filters. That's still not how it's supposed to be. You need to watch my video. But I'm glad that you're on. You're motivated to fix this. <clears throat> uh, 
PJ Goblin says, uh, it's evening in the UK, and he asked what my thoughts were on a single azure damselfish in a 50-gallon tank. I love the color. 50-50 um, risk, are they that bad? Well, damselfish can be aggressive, but if you just want that fish in your tank, or if you want 25 of that fish in that tank all by itself, why not enjoy it? But if you're trying to put that damsel with other fish and there's fighting and squabbling, then it wasn't really a good choice. I guess I should say to all of you, Happy New Year's to every one of you in advance. It's, we're almost there. Cracker Jack says, my New Year's goal for my tank is to successfully transition to Triton method and start getting SPS, uh, spe uh, specifically Acropora. And where do you recommend getting SPS coral frags from? If you can go to a frag swap, you have the pick of the litter and you can find all kinds of beautiful pieces. If you uh, have a, a fish store near you, of course they should have frags available. There are companies that sell frags online. Uh, Reefpets.com is it one of them that comes to mind. Cherry Corals, I believe, still sells online. Maybe not. He's running a shop these days. I'm not positive on that one. Um, Extreme Corals was selling corals online. Live Aquarius sells corals online. You can ask your fish store to bring in ORA corals, and they will bring them in you know, to the store, and you can go pick them up there in person. So these are all sources, and of course, any hobbyist in your area, you can get a frag from them. And I love trading frags with hobbyists rather than buying them, but... Occasionally, I'll walk into a store and see something I gotta have, and I buy it. Like, uh, someone asked me about the uh, bubble coral in my anemone cube that you just saw uh, two days ago. And they asked me, when did you buy that? I think it was about a year and a half ago. Maybe longer. And it was a little tiny bubble coral frag. It was adorable. That's why I bought it. And everyone got mad at me because I bought it because they all wanted it. <laughs> but there was only one. And I put it in that tank, and it has grown and grown. I mean, it's got to be six times the size of what it was. I kind of want to move it into my main reef with all the other LPS corals and kind of get it out of the anemone cube. Brad asks if I'm still running bio pellets. Yes, and they're low. And I'm not going to touch them other than clean that top plate because it's clogged again. Um, because I want to know if the, the uh, export brick is going to work. I'm really hoping the export brick is going to drop my nitrate. So I am just not doing anything with my tank. I'm not changing water. And I'm not, uh, I'm just cleaning the skimmer, of course. But I don't want to do anything to skew the results because I want to know if that brick works. And now it's been four weeks. I feel like it's kicking in now. And I'm hoping that in six to eight weeks, I'm going to see my nitrates just drop. My last test was last Saturday. I haven't tested yet today. And they're still like 50. So I want to see if they'll come down because that's the premise of this brick. It's going to pull it out. And I want to know if it works. And I used one brick because I said one brick treats 500 gallons. My instinct told me to get two bricks. But that's treating 1,000 gallons. And how is that a valid test if you put 1,000 gallons worth of brick in your system to remove nitrate? Because, you know, I want to follow the guidelines. So I, I used one. Though it's tempting to throw in a second one. Mustafa Hassan has been talking a lot about his ability to get things from the ocean. And he asks, do you ship worldwide? I think he's talking to me. I ship mostly in the continental U.S. I ship to Canada. I ship to Mexico. Um, I'm shipping dry goods. I'm not shipping livestock. I'm not shipping animals. Central Pen Realtor says I'm battling and have been fighting for about a year with dinos or diatoms, the brown algae that's taking over, and he's tried everything. 30 years in the hobby, I think I'm done. Looking for anything uh, I've yet to try. Have you tried fluconazole? Have you tried it? If you haven't, it might be the way to go. Um, I'm going to tell you this, and you already know it. You've got 30 years experience, but usually the solution to a big problem in your tank is go absolutely back to the basics. Clean everything from the bottom to the top. Just remove all the extra neato things, the extra dosers, all those things that you do. And what, 
What did you used to do that worked? What have you changed to that now the system doesn't seem to cooperate? Figure out what it is. Like, for example, maybe you always did great with a certain salt brand, and now you've switched to a new salt, and ever since you're dealing with it. Or maybe you always used a certain uh, magnesium brand, and you've switched. Or maybe you've uh, switched lighting. I mean, even lighting spectrums. Or maybe your lighting's so old that it's fueling the stuff and it needs to be replaced with a, a newer spectrum. These are some thoughts that come to mind. But for me, it's really cleaning. It's just deep cleaning your tank. Clean everything. Scrape the walls. Take out the lock line. Dip everything in the acid or in the vinegar. And get it brand new plastic again and reinstall it. Clean your pumps. Take out your cleaning magnets. Clean the cleaning magnet. Look at it. Inspect it. Look for cracks. Check your heaters. Check for stray electricity. Um, check for anything that could be getting in the tank that doesn't belong, like I was saying earlier, in, environmentally. Uh, double check your temperatures. Double check you know, stray electricity in, from any uh, gear that's in your tank. Um, keep on top of cleaning your skimmer on a regular basis. The things you used to do a long time ago, when you're in the hobby a long time, you you get more lackadaisical about it. You you lazy and you just don't care as much and you're like well i shouldn't have to do all this work well sometimes we have to and last week i worked on one thing after another after another after another after another for my tank and i was like man i should have logged this because <laughs> probably someone would have appreciated seeing me doing all these normal things that you know they assume i i don't have to do i have this midas touch where really it's just hard work and i don't just ignore the tank i try to keep my hands out of the tank but there's things I have to do on a regular basis to keep it healthy and happy. Uh, Justin Johnson asks, is the app available for Android yet? It's coming out in January. I was told do not tell you a date. <coughs> 15th is my hope, but I don't know. It could be the 29th. I really don't know. But it's coming out in January. That's what I'm told. Anthony McKay says, I wonder how well Coca-Cola would work at cleaning since it's acidic. I suppose you could pour a Coke over your, uh, your power head in a bucket or, or soak it in some. Um, I think someone in your family might get mad that you're using their drink to clean something. Uh, I think vinegar's cheaper overall. You get a gallon of it for two bucks. And no sugar. <laughs> okay. Reefkeeper said fluconazole works for biopsis. That's right. That's what that one is for. But it seems to be curing other things. Uh, the Dino X, good luck with that. I really hope it works. Please give me your results. I don't care how you contact me. Contact me through the live stream. Send me an email. Send me a PM. Uh, you know, contact us on the website. Whatever it takes. I'd love to hear your results and how it went. As far as I know, Dino X takes 21 days uh, for the full treatment, and you have to follow the instructions very carefully. But the people at Fauna Marine or Fauna Marin said it definitely works. So that's awesome. Uh, Josh Armenta says, what's going on with Elos? I've not been able to find any Elos test kits and was told Elos has filed for bankruptcy. Is this true? Is it going out of business? I have not heard that at all. I have a business card to the Elos rep because I um, sell their test kits. I have them in stock if you need them. But I haven't talked to them in a few weeks. I don't think anything's changed that dramatically. Um, I know that Coralview no longer uh, supplies it. You know, I go directly to Elos now and get my stuff from them. So I hope they're not going away because I love their test kits. I mean, I literally use them exclusively for all my tests. <clears throat> uh, Google really sucks. I love that name. Uh, wants to know, should I use a needle valve before or after the calcium reactor? You can use it before, that's how I use it. Or you can use it after, it's your choice. I like to do before to limit how much water comes in because whatever I'm limiting going in, that's how much will come out. And I have mine running at a constant trickle. It's not dripping out, it's trickling out. I um, am reading this comment from Mandrake Fernflower talking about dosing chlorine into a system and I'm just going to shake my head. Wow. I'm not saying it's wrong. I think it's crazy. I'm not putting chlorine in my tank. <clears throat> and uh, good luck with that. <clears throat> VO0633 asks, what are your thoughts on the MQ510 par meter? 
Is that the latest PAR meter from Apogee, or is that a different brand? Uh, I like the PAR meters from Apogee. I've had several over the years. I heard they have a brand new one that came out that's supposed to work with LED technology really nicely, but I don't know the model number. Is that what this one is? Um, I, I can't answer on that specific one. I don't know it. <clears throat> <laughs> Anthony McKay says, My daughter just walked in and heard dino flatulence and is in hysterics on the floor. Well, tell your daughter she's hilarious too. Maurice Moore says, The video is out of sync with the audio. That's yeah, possible. That happens. It's a live stream. Oh, yeah. Worldwide Coral sells corals, of course, online. Jason Fox sells corals. I think his you have to pick up at Frag Swaps. I don't think he ships. Unique corals out of California. I just visited them. Forgot about them. They sell beautiful corals. Uh, Tidal Gardens sells corals. There's lots. There's lots of them. <clears throat> I've never tried Nopox or NO3 POX, PO4X uh, I, because my tank's so big. It would take a lot of that stuff to use it, but I'm wanting to see if the brick works. I, I'm curious. If the brick doesn't work, I'll go to bio pellets. If the bio pellets won't work, I'll go to vodka. I don't care. I mean, I did vodka for three years. It worked fine. I just like the idea of bio pellets being 24 hours a day, no risk of an overdose. D3V1115H says, what's the best way to lower my nitrates? They are sky high at 160. And yes, those are sky high. On my 20-gallon overstocked reef tank with a 10-gallon sump and a hang-on refugium. D3V1115H. I love that. What is that? Your prison barcode? <laughs> okay, last week, one person called me an idiot, and another one called me arrogant. I hope you guys know I have a sense of humor, and everything makes me laugh and makes me happy, and uh, I'm never out to be mean to anyone. So if you think I'm those things, I can't control it. I will always be me, and uh, I, you got to have a sense of humor. If you don't have a sense of humor, what is life about? Anyway. You need to change water on your tank. You need to change a ton of water on that tank. And dude, your tank is so small, it's an easy task. If I had 160 ppm nitrate on my 450 gallon system, that would suck. That's 450 gallons of water I gotta change once, twice, three times, right? That's 1,500 gallons of water. You have to change 20. Drain the tank, fill it up with water. Match your pH, your salinity, and your temperature exactly the same as your tank. Drain it and refill it. Use a pump to refill it. You know, put something on the end so it doesn't squirt on anything or point it at a rock so that way it just, you know, it doesn't like kick up sand or, or hurt a coral or whatever. But drain it out. It'll take five minutes. Pump it back in. It takes five minutes and ten minutes. You've literally cut your nitrate in half at least, if not more. And I would just say do a couple of big water changes. And bam, your nitrates will be gone. All this other stuff you're trying to do, you know, gradually, forget it. It's a 20-gallon tank. If you, uh... And get your hands on a trash can that holds 33 gallons of water. You could literally have as much salt water in that trash can as your whole system holds, and you could do a 100% water change basically and get those numbers down really fast in a matter of one or two water changes and then test, see how it did. Um, if they start gradually building up, find out what's creating them. It could be sponges, bio wheels, bio balls, bio floss, any you know, socks that are full of crap, anything like that that you're not cleaning out regularly adds nitrate to the water. And of course, feeding adds nitrate to the water too. Jose Moray said, his tests are done. Congratulations. I'll be checking Instagram later. I want to see them. So please do post them and then tag me at Mila's Reef. Use hashtag uh, water testing hashtag post your results so others will join in the fun. Oh, yes, Pete. I announced who won the fan last week and uh, I already shipped it. He already got it. He's using it. That's done. On YouTube, when you're on my page, there's a tab called Community. And not only did I put the winner in the uh, description or uh, in the comments underneath that video, but I put it a screenshot in community. I started putting a picture on there like once a day to uh, kind of use that area of my page. So feel free to check that. And you can see the winner right there. The person that won the book has not come forward yet. I'm still waiting for Corey something to get with me. His book's waiting. Yeah, okay, thank you, Vio0633. I didn't know that was the model number of the new Apogee PAR meter. Tell me, I'll, I'll Google it. I need to learn more about it. When I was at Machina, they were walking around with a new meter that they said worked with Bluetooth with any smartphone. 
was like, that's awesome. So if I can just use that and use my phone to like track the results, that would be incredible. And I love that, that premise. I hope that's real. Yeah, I know you said Bob, I'm sorry, Mandrake Fernflower said, I don't do it. Bob Stark of ESV is doing it. Um, okay. I, I'm not putting down Bob. I, I actually used ESV Bionic for years, and I hope it didn't have chlorine in it back then. <laughs> I did. I love Bionic. That stuff's awesome. For, for those of you guys with small tanks, Bionic is a great uh, two-part liquid additive. It's alkaline and calcium with about 80 other trace elements. And I just dosed that on my 29 gallon. I had a beautiful little reef tank with that. And I also used it on my 55 gallon. When I switched to the 280, that's a huge tank. I had a calcium reactor. And then, you know, I added the four, you know, I switched to the 400 gallon, st still the same calcium reactor. So. Reefkeeper says, how's your neck after your fusion? I've had a fusion and a total disc replacement. It's still in pain. Did it work for you? What they did, I'll show you a picture of what they did. They didn't fuse my bones. What they did was they inserted a bionic disc in my neck. So I'm going to hold... Hmm, you know what? I can do this. So get ready, guys. It's going to be creepy. <clears throat> So that is, I think you're seeing it by now, maybe. Uh, that is my neck, and there's my bionic disc in there. And there's a close-up of it. And this thing is basically like an Oreo cookie inside my neck. It's made of titanium with a disc in the middle that's made of the same material, like cutting board material. And that thing allows my neck to turn left and right still, instead of being fused to where you can no longer turn your neck. This was installed on my neck uh, two years ago, and I'm still dealing with back pain. But what I did is I went ahead and I joined a gym three days ago. And then I went ahead and I hired a personal trainer to teach me how to use the equipment in the gym because I am not a gym person. I, I, I hate sweat. I hate exercise. I just want to be healthy. And I want to strengthen my back muscles to help reduce the pain that develops between my shoulder blades and goes up in my neck that leads to headaches. These happen all the time. Um, I pretty much am a guy that takes three Aleve tablets every single day, and I just deal. I just work through the pain. If it's really bad or it turns into a migraine, then I, I just, that's it. For, you know, that was Tuesday. I'll see you the next day. But for the most part, I just have a constant pain in my back. I've got some exercises, exercises I can do at home. I've got a foam roller that I roll on. But I decided about a week ago, I'm going to join a gym, and I'm going to focus on building up those muscles on my back. And when I talked with her yesterday, she's a real nice girl, she said that, um, you know, what are your goals? What do you want to accomplish? And I told her, I said, I want to strengthen this so it doesn't hurt. And I said, and I don't mind losing some of the belly. You know, I have a little bit of a belly I'd like gone. And I said, you know, I'd, I'm fine with, I'd like to lose that as, as well. It's not critical, but it would be an awesome uh, side benefit of what I'm dealing with. And uh, I told her, I said, you know, if I end up building up muscle and I look right and I weigh more, I don't care. I've never been, I have to hit a certain weight, this is the thing. I mean, yes, I've been setting goals for years, and I want to hit a certain weight, and right now I'm 1.2 pounds where I'd like to hit a goal, but I don't know that it's going to give me the stomach. I, I want that flat stomach that I see in the movies. I know that those guys kill themselves on gyms. Well, hey, I joined a gym, so I'm going to try it myself and see what I can do. Uh, just, I just want to clean up a little bit better. I, I, just, I just want to feel good about myself, and... I don't feel bad, but I'm a little bit vain. I'm on camera a lot, and uh, so I, I, I'd like to look a little bit better. That's just what I'd like. That's one of my goals, um, and it's been an ongoing one. About five years ago, I decided I need to lose weight before I'm so old it's hard to lose weight. I was worried about, you know, what if your knees go out and you can't go walk, you know, for exercise or, or whatever. You know, I like, let me just deal with this now. And over the past five years, I've dropped almost 40 pounds gradually I just dropped you know 10 and I kind of stayed at a spot and then I went down 10 and then and every year I have my macna weight I'm trying to hit and like this year I got within 1.2 pounds of that macna weight and uh, didn't hit it and then today I'm actually 1.2 pounds from that weight I'd like to hit but since I'm joining the gym the number really isn't a factor you know 
uh, the trainer did measurements all over and we'll see how that works out but I'm really hoping it'll reduce the pain in my neck uh, the reason we did the disc in my neck instead of fusion uh, I, I kind of glossed over kind of quickly is that if you take the two bones and you concrete them together as one they can no longer pivot but when you have that thing in between you can still turn and you know I want to be able to look over my shoulder and when I'm driving a car I want to see if there's a car there or a car here you know I want to be able to use my head uh, Rod from Rod's Food he's had so many neck surgeries that he is like he's like iron he's like Iron Man and yet he now you know, I'm not putting him down. It just sucks. I mean, he's had a lot of neck surgeries trying to deal with this pain. He can't, like, drink a drink because his neck is locked up. So he has to, you know, sip or tilt his whole body back to drink out of a glass and, uh, or use a straw. And I don't want, I didn't want that. I do feel like I might need another disc because, you know, there's other areas where the, uh, the, uh, what's that thing called? The discs between the bones degenerate, and so I feel like I need another one at some point, but so far, I, I got pretty lucky. Uh, okay, great question, Vio6. Um, again, we're doing Is your name Violet by any chance? Vio0633. Uh, I got the new PAR meter to dial in my lights. What's a good par for most SPS corals? Do colors do corals color up better with blue or white spectrum in your opinion? The uh, the par measurement should be at the sand bed somewhere between 100 to 200 for some corals. Then as you work your way up the reef higher and higher, you could go to 400, 500, 600, 800. I mean, it can be really crazy high numbers, but your corals have to acclimate to that. So, for example, Let's just say you've got a coral sitting on a rock that's been there a year, and it's beautiful. Measure the par of that coral, and that is the number that coral seems to like. Now, if you go buy a brand new frag and put it right next to that one that's doing so great and it doesn't do well, imagine why. It probably didn't come from that kind of intensity. So whenever I get a new frag, I put it down on the sand bed, and then after a couple of weeks, I'll move it up, and then you know eventually it'll go to the spot where I want it to be. So it's kind of gotten used to the intensity as it gets stronger and stronger, and I'm not just pounding it with light. Let's see. Uh, and then spectrum-wise, you said, should it be white or blue? Uh, mm. White promotes growth. Blue promotes color. So finding that happy mixture would be ideal. My tank gets a... a, a I was going to say a gallon. An hour and a half of white light or 10K lighting every single day, and then it switches to 20K for about four and a half hours. And then, of course, there's the XHO LEDs that are on 11 hours a day, you know, the whole day. Uh, that gives it that extra blue punch that makes the tank look awesome. Uh, Corey, hang on. Ugh. I got to unplug this mic. Okay, I'm plugging it back in. Now you have to tell me if you can hear me. Let me make sure the mic restarted. Test, test, can you hear me? Okay, hopefully it works. Corey Simpson, I just saw you in my thing. You are the winner of this book. I've been waiting for you to contact me so I can ship it to you. Please send me your shipping information, uh, address and email address, and I'll get that over to the post office and get it on its way to you. Congratulations, buddy. Um, I've never even heard of that. Uh, Mandrake says, have you ever tried... Gabapentin for back pain? I don't know. So no, I have not. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry you deal with migraines too. We'll see about being ripped. Uh, that's not really my goal. I'm not looking to look like a Navy SEAL. Just want to look healthy to me when I get out of the shower. <laughs> that's the truth. Oh, God. Uh, bottom line, my goal with this gym thing, it's a, it's a three-month thing. I basically want three months to just get this thing handled and strengthen my back to reduce the headaches and uh, not have to rely on a leave. And then uh, I hope I can just do, like, maintenance. I mean, the gym I joined is fine. they got lots of equipment. They've got cardio. They've got uh, uh, the room where you can all, I don't know, Zumba together or do HIIT, some kind of high-intensity uh, 
cardio training? Oh, that's not the right initials. Uh, anyway, there's different things you can do, but I just kind of want to... What I, I'd like to do some of the stuff I've seen on TV, like when they take the ropes and they do that. I, th <laughs> I think that'd be kind of cool. Um, I want to try the uh, kettle weight kettlebell. I think that's right. Uh, I just want to try some different things. And uh, eh, I don't know. I, I, it's not going to be long term. But I swear to you, it was not a, oh, it's January 1st. I need to join a gym. I joined five days ago. So I'm definitely not one of those people. <laughs> But I, I just thought, I'm going to do something more. i got to do something. And uh, what I'm doing right now is not working. You know, it's just, it's getting worse. So i, I got to focus on strengthening my back. Oh, let's see. <laughs> um, Pandrake says, just eat some more gargonians. Those have anti-inflammation compounds in them. Ha <laughs> ha. Whatever, I don't even believe you. And even if it's true, I still don't believe you. And I'm not going to eat my Gorgonians. Let's see. Where can you buy acrylic in the DFW area? Speaking of DFW, I've got some news about that too. Uh, there is Regal Plastics. There's Allied Plastics. There is... Oh, what's that third company? I just shot, bought from them a few months ago. Ah, Google is your friend. Type in acrylic supplier Dallas-Fort Worth, and I'm sure you'll find 10 companies. Um... Can't think of the third one, but uh, yeah, those are the places to get acrylic. Fabian is on with our group. He's here from France. I love that we have an international chat. That's awesome. High intensity interval training. Yes, apparently that might be something in my future. Once, I probably won't last. You know, the, first, the okay, I know you guys are here about reef keeping. I'm just talking about health because, you know, I want to be healthy. Uh, I had to do a plank and I had to do some kind of a wall squat where you lean against the wall and have to hold that position as long as you can and uh, a couple other things and uh, I'm sure that the reason she measured those yesterday is so like in a month I can do those exact same things again and see that I last three times longer I mean that's my assumption uh, it was not um, easy of course and now believe it or not and that's just orientation basically and I'm sore <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even done anything yet, but uh, whatever. I'd rather just focus on this and just really apply myself to this like I do anything. Anything I do, I do it 100%. I don't like to just do things halfway. That's why I didn't just join a gym. I joined a gym and got a trainer. And, uh, you know, when I set up a reef tank, I set up with really good gear. And uh, when I got a CNC, I got a really good machine that will cut out four foot by eight foot, you know, sheets of acrylic. Or in the case of, did I mention it yesterday? Did I talk about this yet? I, it's, we've been talking for over an hour. I already forgot. Uh, I built an aquarium stand on the CNC, and that was very scary for me yesterday. Uh, I put a, you know, I had to cut three different sheets of plywood to make this stand. Um, I'm finishing it up today, and I deliver it tomorrow. Yeah, I talked about that. I remember that now. But um, again, I got a machine that could do the task I wanted. It wasn't like this will get me by. I always go full on for exactly what will do best. You know, just like, you know, I don't buy a cheap TV because I want the nicer one. I just save up until I can finally get the nice TV. Okay. D3V1115H uh, asks, why, what causes nitrates besides overfeeding? Um, waste, decay, sitting in your system. Dirty filter socks, bio wheels, bio balls, uh, bio floss. Uh, anything bio... That's part of your filtration. Uh, a sock filled up with brown gook that's just overflowing. Those are all things that create nitrate. Uh, a sand bed can trap nitrate. Rocks can uh, release nitrate because they're just so old. These are all things that can do it. Um, my tank sitter always had a nitrate problem, and he used nopox to remove it. And that was the only thing that worked for him on his tank. Uh, I still think to this day his kids throw food in the tank all the time, and he doesn't know it because he's at work. And that's what drives him up because the guy has a beautiful SPS reef, but nitrate was an ongoing battle and it made no sense because all his gear was great. So I just feel like uh, somebody was feeding that tank. Do you have a way to take off the membrane cap on my uh, RO system? Mine is stuck. Yes. You need two strap wrenches and you put one on the housing, you put one on the cap and you do that. You can try putting it under warm water, but the strap wrenches are awesome. If you can go to a Harbor Freight, they're cheap. 
Um, if you don't want to do Harbor Freight, you can check Amazon and you'll get one in a couple of days. I think it was like eight or nine or ten dollars for a two pack. And strap wrenches are really nice because they're made of rubber, they got a big hard plastic handle, and as you do this, you know, they grip and, and they loosen. And you uh, don't scar up the housing like you would with wrenches. Like if you got a couple of channel locks, you're going to bite into the PVC cap, you're going to bite into the PVC body, and you're finally going to wrench it loose, and you're going to have those teeth marked in the plastic forever, and they'll never go away. So strap wrenches, do that. Okay, uh, I told you I had something newsworthy to tell you. If you were in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, on January 10th, DFW Mass is doing a coral fragging demonstration. So if you've never fragged a coral, and you want to see how it's done, you are invited. And this is a club meeting. We meet in Grapevine, which is near the airport. And it's from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock. That is the second Wednesday of January. So if you can come Wednesday night, you can come check that out. It's actually a coral business that is doing the fragging demonstration for the club. Um, sorry, I don't remember their name, so I can't give them a free plug right now. But um, details are on dfwmass.org. Matter of fact, I'll just look it up really quick, and now I can just tell you. dfwmass.org. And the uh, event is loading. I've been looking at the wrong camera the whole time again. Sorry, guys. Fraghouse Corals is doing the demonstration. Brandon Ware is the person doing it. And he is uh, going to show how to cut up corals. So there you go. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in again for the live stream. We will talk again next year. Yeah, I love using that line. And uh, I checked the date. There's nothing special happening that date. It's still 2 o'clock on Saturday. And uh, maybe you can tell me about some of your resolutions for your reef next week. And I'll have another uh, compelling topic for you. I really enjoyed this back and forth with the Q&A today. That was fun. I didn't really expect that to happen. I thought you were going to tell me what stuff you bought and uh, what things you wanted to do. And instead, I answered, answered a lot of questions. So that's kind of cool. So take care. And enjoy your weekend. Test your water. Post your results on Instagram. Subscribe to my channel if you're new. Uh, follow me on Facebook. Follow me on Instagram. And uh, keep your reefs happy because this hobby is all about beauty. And we want our tanks to look as beautiful as they can. Bye, guys.